with um, the association and everybody's been so nice and welcoming and I look forward to being here long term forever and I'm <laughs> always available um, and I, I'm new so I'm learning everything on the island but I'm always available and willing to help out and answer any questions that anyone has. Hopefully it's going to be a lot duller for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to handle it. And then we're going to blame, blame everything that happened in the last two years on Mark. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, when, when Tony told me that Mark was um, taking this other opportunity, um, yeah, naturally I said, well, yeah, is there anything we can do to change his mind? He said, I don't think so. And so the next question was, have you thought have you begun to think about um, uh, any possibilities to bring in as, as a replacement? And, and he said, funny you should mention that. I have someone, and he said this in front of Mark, he said, I have someone who is even better than Mark. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, let me see your resume. And I, uh, and I looked at him and I said, holy smokes, you weren't kidding. Um, she, she's been through more training than probably outside of Tony, the rest of our security staff uh, combined. So I'm um, really glad to have Kelly on board. Um, uh, Kiowa and Kika is the learning curve. I know some of you have been here for a long time and, and still find yourself from time to time asking the question, who does that? Um, and so uh, I know it'll take a little time to get up to speed, but, um, but we're glad to have Kelly. Uh, the reason Tony and Kelly are here is because um, today I wanted Tony to spend some time talking about uh, some of the um, technology enhancements that we are bringing to our uh, security department. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. We actually funded uh, some of it last year and we're now in implementation uh, phase of some of those um, improvements that we funded last year. There's more to come this year. Uh, but um, I wanted to spend at least the first part of our uh, session today letting Tony talk about that and answering your questions on on those types of things. And then once once we've answered all your questions there, we can kind of open it up to um, all Kika topics, which is the way we do these um, sessions is we spend some time on, on a particular subject and then and then open it up. So um, when Tony came to Kika, one of the things that uh, he was kind of known for at the city of Charleston Police Department was um, always looking for opportunities to use technology to make it better. And, and, and I remember the first conversation I had with Tony about this, he said, I, look, I never see technology as um, is replacing your your force. It's it's more of a force accelerator. It, it gives your people an opportunity to be better. And so um, we have um, utilized in his time here uh, technology to get better on a number of fronts. Um, we I don't even know how many cameras we have uh, deployed across the island now, but we have used those cameras in real ways. Uh, for results, um, and we we just had a an incident last week where we didn't we didn't solve a crime or anything by having the cameras, but there was a reported incident about um, a dispute at the gate, um, and uh, the interestingly the guest version of the story was very different from what showed up on the tape. And so in addition to providing some ability to um, improve our security, it's also good for, for our staff. And I think that's why you see more and more police officers around the country are wearing body cameras because there a lot of, a lot of things get lobbed um, in the direction of law enforcement and, and you want to be able to defend yourself. Um, but, but cameras have played a pivotal role uh, in making some arrests. Of, of people that were, were uh, stealing things or, or should not have been on the island. So uh, cameras are, are an area where, where Tony has really brought his technology expertise um, to keep the, to, to make us better. Um, we've even um, looped in some regimes that, that were having some issues. They've installed cameras that now link up with 
with our gate, so our gate folks can monitor on behalf of regimes. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we had a, a pretty antiquated communication system for our security personnel where it was literally having to dial cell phone numbers to communicate and uh, particularly in an emergency situation where there's a lot of back and forth communication that proves to be difficult um, and, and cumbersome. It's also um, pretty darn expensive to be paying for a bunch of cell phones and so working with uh, the resort who already had a pretty significant radio system and a repeater installed up in the um, sanctuary, we were able to build onto their system and transition all of our folks to uh, radio communications, uh, which uh, is more efficient, but it also provides some opportunities during those emergencies where um, they can switch to an event channel. And so everyone, not just our, staff, our security staff, our land staff, the resort staff, law enforcement, they can all be on the same channel as necessary and communicating in real time to, uh, to deal with issues. Um, I know that there are others that I've, I've forgotten, but those are just a couple of examples of things that we have done in the last couple of years. And now I'll turn it over to Tony to talk about some of the stuff that's in the works right now and, and, and you will begin to see as, as residents very soon, we think. So, uh, good morning. I'm uh, glad to be here. I'm uh, glad to spend my third year here now. And, um, the thing that excited me most about the job when I got it and I actually sat down with uh, Jenny and, and Shannon um, is that they really had a vision for improving uh, not only the staff, which is fundamental, uh, when I say that, I'm talking about their customer service, their uh, knowledge, skills, and ability about their jobs. That's fundamental things that you have to have no matter what widget you put there. Um, so we're constantly working on, on the improvement of our human, most important assets. Um, the other part of it was is that they had a willingness, and not only willingness, but a direction to me to actually look at technology and to see how we could use it to accelerate what we're doing and make things better and make things safer. And yet I was still cautioned not to turn it into Fort Knox because they know that I come from a military background and also a law enforcement background. So we could easily lock this place up and no one would get in, but y'all would not like living here because it'd take you forever to get home. Um, so having that balance was something I had to learn uh, at first. Um, and after learning that, I had to look at what we had. Jimmy's already talked about a lot of things we've already replaced because they either need to be added, they need to be replaced, or they just never existed and they needed to be put in place. And one of the things that I noted when I got here is that we had an antiquated system for gate management, that actually the company had already gone out of business and purchased by another company, um, and we couldn't even use some of the features that were in there. And that's the company we're using right now, and the system's called Capture, for those of y'all that are interested. It has a lot of good capabilities. It's good for what we're doing right now. But it doesn't take advantage of a lot of technological advantages that have happened over the last 10 to 15 years. So what we've done is we went around and I went to different communities um, and finally ended up selecting a nationwide company called ABDI, and that is uh, Applications by Design Incorporated, um, and getting them to come in and actually you know, work with us to give us a bid for a system that would allow us to come into the century, basically. Um, and with that, we believe that we're going to be going live with the majority of the system in June at some point. When we do that, the changes that you're going to see are really a matter of efficiencies and convenience, and also security and safety. So let's talk first about the efficiency and convenience. Today, you call us and you tell us that you'd like to have a pass center and we take care of that for you. Or you email us and you know, you get a response back from us that we put it in there. Um, and some people still fax us uh, a list, believe it or not, they still fax us. And what we did is we changed that into an email so that they think it's a fax, but we're really getting an email. We don't have a fax receipt anymore. Um, but I didn't want to change that. So point being, those ways that you're doing it now, you can always continue to do. However, what we're going to do is we're going to offer some opportunities for some enhancements in that to where you'll be able to go on the internet with the new system and actually put your own guest in. Then you'll end up developing a list of guests that you'll be able to just drop down the frequent guests and just click on them again and say when they're gonna be there um, and put them right on the internet. So
So most of us are running around a lot, but we don't always sit at our computer. Well, guess what? There's an app for everything, right? There's an app for this. Um, it comes with an app that you'll actually be able to use that you can go in and you can put your guests in there as well. So on the fly, while you're out to eat, somebody calls you up and says, I want to come over to your house tonight. You're like, no problem. And you're in Hawaii. Um, you simply put it in the app and it goes into our system because it's in the cloud. So it goes into the system immediately and we get notified that there is a um, visitor's pass to everybody. So then they come to the gate. There's a number of ways that they actually can get through the gate now. Uh, one, they can do what they've always done and say, I'm Tony Elder and I'm here to visit so-and-so at 123 Buffalo. And we simply look it up, Elder, yep, print the pass and we give it to them. Another way is, and this is what I really like, is they can just come and they can take their phone, they can hold it up and it will have the QR code, which is that little square box. If anybody doesn't know what that is, I'll show you afterwards. A little square box, they just hold it up like this and they scan it. When we scan it, it prints their pass immediately. That's a telephone case, it won't break us. Um, so um, it's really going to be a whole lot more convenient um, for, for all of y'all. And the last feature of that that really is of convenience, and, and not only that, but safety feature, is you'll be notified if you choose to be notified, so you can opt in on this, that your guest has arrived. Okay? So the beauty of that is you can doing any numbers of things anywhere um, and be visiting your neighbor and say, oh, Tony's here to see me, Dad, and you have to go back over to your house and let me in. Um, and it's going to be a wonderful feature that I think a lot of you are going to like. Now, one area that's going to be of interest to me that, that um, as we talked about it, is going to be contractors. Because what's going to happen that's going to end up holding them a little bit more accountable with the system Today, they come and they say they're going to your house to do work, okay? They're given a pass, sold a pass, to go to your house to do work. You don't normally have to always call us because the call volume would be way too high if you've got a call for every single contract that was coming to every single thing. Now what will happen though is they'll be put in the system like they are today, but they'll actually be put in the system and you can be notified that Tony Elder Plumbing has come and said they're going to your house. And you may discover and have to call us and say, I didn't invite them to come to my house. Mm -hmm. So we may end up finding out that some contractors may not be doing exactly what they say they're doing. Enhancement of safety and security. Um, so if people will just use that, it'll be, it'll be fantastic. And we'll go over this a lot more. There'll be a lot more information that communications who lives here, as they told you, um, will be sharing with you including step-by-step -step instructions on the app, step-by-step -step instructions on the website. Uh, so you're not just gonna be thrown in there and, and not know what to do. You'll actually be receiving your username and, and a passcode. Um, one change that's gonna happen that we really need to get out in the community is you're going to have to have a passcode, okay? Up to now, it's always been optional. And some people have it on their account. Most people don't. I'd say probably 95% of people don't have any kind of code on their account. So they call up and they get asked questions to make sure that they are the person they say they are. A lot of times we'll look at the number and it'll be the same number that's in the system. Um, so we're trying to cross-reference this. And then I get complaints, infrequent, but enough complaints that somebody's calling in passes, it's a relative of theirs, it's using their house when they're not here. Um, somebody who used to stay with them still knows how to get in and they come on the island and they're utilizing and using their, their services. Well, one, you don't even know that's happening, okay? And two, I don't, I don't know how to stop it because they're telling me they're you and they have everything to know about you um, unless all of a sudden I say, you have a problem, so now you need a passcode. We're gonna do that with everyone. Now, you will have the option, you'll get an initial one, but you'll have the option to change that, obviously, to whatever you want, and change it as frequently as you want. Um, so if you have somebody that gets that information and you want to, stop that and you just change it again. <clears throat> There's also the cross check on that, because remember if somebody does get in the island for some reason and give them their code, you're going to know that a visitor just came on that you didn't invite in and you're gonna know the calls. So a lot of that is really gonna not only be much more convenient, but in my opinion, a lot safer um, because you're gonna know who's coming to the island to visit you and who you say is, is not supposed to be here. Now, if you get somebody and it's a notification, do me a favor. If you didn't invite them, don't ignore it. Okay, don't ignore it. Call us and let us not only one look into it and flag that person and investigate what's going on, 
But even an attempt to find them or where they're at in the island right now. Um, Maybe a challenge, but we can at least attempt that. Now here's the beauty of one of the other things that we're installing as part of this system. When I say system, these are not individual components. What we've been doing is trying to find things that work together. There's some synergy there so that we don't have five applications to open up and run everything. In this system, we also have automatic license plate readers. So when you're coming on the island, it's going to read your license plate and it's going to store it. It's going to link it to the address that you're going to. Okay, so I come in, one, two, three, bucklehead. It's going to take my picture with one of the cameras of the many that we have installed, over 30. It's going to take a picture and it's going to install it in that visitation. And then it's also going to take a picture of the license plate and put it in the system. Okay. Then when you leave, it's going to tell us you left because there's outbound license plate readers. Now this is all at main gate, and that's the only place I have it installed right now. Though we may in the future do something at B gate, it just wasn't something that was fiscally responsible to do all at once. Um, the other thing that I want to do with the license plate readers that wasn't fiscally responsible to do all at once is I want to put some license plate readers in our patrol vehicles in the future if Jimmy Shannon and the board who have been so kind to let us do everything we're doing now, sees that vision. What I want to do is I want to try to put them in the car so that when they're riding around, they'll get a hit on a car that maybe they're not supposed to be on the island. Or they'll get a hit on a car that they were supposed to be at the sand castle and they're way over here. Or they're supposed to be at the sanctuary and they're at the sand castle. Um, they're a visitor and they're not supposed to be where they're at. Um, so building out that system so we can use the license plate as a means to cross-check where somebody's at uh, versus where they're supposed to be. Um, Has there been any thought to integrating the front uh, gate, main gate, pass process into the Kika app as opposed to having a separate app? Amazing you should say that. And with that, I'm going to just go like this really quick. <clears throat> because yes. Yes, we thought about it. We're not sure we can do it immediately. Um, but that is a focus that we should not have two apps because one, yeah. it makes sense to download one for your community. Well, I think it, it, it's a way of driving people to the Kika app, right. which is always good. And you can right. password protect it like you normally would. And that's what we've been talking about is how do we do that? <clears throat> now, because the company that we picked is a designer, they can customize for Kiwa. Yeah. So we can do that. It's just a matter of <coughs> figuring out exactly how to do it, exactly what we want and then figuring out the cost factor and then running that through the traditional version of the system. Um, yes, sir. Can your security vehicles go through some of the resort locations and see if the people who say they're having meeting somebody for lunch or at a prep bar actually go there? Or yes. <laughs> are not someplace else? Yes, because that's, just, that's a huge problem. People just talk to your hands. Um, and we're working very closely with on, on a number of things, and I'll talk about the pass office in a minute so you understand where we're headed with that. But Roger and his staff have been working so closely with us and, and in such a lockstep with making the improvements that you would probably be impressed with, with where that's headed. Uh, but we already uh, jointly patrol the different areas with the resort, and certainly we're in a, a, a process of sharing the information with them so that we can all, their 12 security and our 36 can do what we need to do together. Um, but yes, to answer your, your question, that can become a future possibility. Not only can they do that, but if somebody wanted to, you, they could actually install license plate readers at their facilities and know they're there. Um, the other part of the app that's there, which is, a, which is a very nice feature, is if they actually want to, they could put at the, let's say, the Ryder Cup bar. Uh, Tony Elmer says, going to the Ryder Cup bar, I'm giving a pass. It will actually notify the Ryder Cup bar. Tony Elmer says it's coming there. They have the option if they decide to implement it where they can put an iPad or some other type of device there and it will sit there and say Tony Elmer is supposed to be coming here. And they can click on it and say I've arrived. And then what we can do is we can back end search that and say who didn't arrive. Okay. Now the challenge there is, is trying to figure out, because Roger and I were talking about this with his executive team, some people say they're going to go there and then they because that's their first stop, and then they're going to go play golf, okay? And they realize they're running behind, so they just meet up with somebody to go play golf and don't check in the Ryder Cup bar. So there are some challenges that we have to work through, but what I suggested to them is, 
Because if you don't take one time, one person not showing up as an indication to block that person in the end from the item. Now you get to the tenth time that that person has never showed up where they say they're going to go, we have a reason to talk about flagging them. Kind of like I might do with you. If somebody says they're coming to your house constantly, you're going to get with me faster than I get with you. Right. Okay. And tell me they're, they're, they're not they're coming to my house. You know, I don't know who they are. Um, the resort is a little bit more challenging because they're a public facility, right? But nonetheless, <coughs> it can get to the point where it's such a volume that we need to do something with it. And we're talking about that, and that is in the future cards. We just have to be delicate on where we're headed with that and kind of phase it in. Okay? Yes. In the system health uh, issue of rental passes, like them coming out six or seven of them for two bedroom units? Yes. In actuality, what we're doing is we're going to be the, the process that was put into place a few years ago to deal with the rental passes was very timely. It was a great process for what had to happen to stop what was going on, to stop the VA from backing it up. It really worked out well to then make it where we would actually send them the passes and they would actually give them in their packet. However, we don't need that anymore. Okay? I met with the rental agencies and what's going to happen is there's a rental portal. So in that rental portal, eventually will be built out the number of passes that are people that are on the cars and allowed to be in their residence. And they'll be responsible to put their own guests in, just like you would for your house. And once that third person shows up at a two bedroom, you know, two cars, all that's allowed, there's an example, um, it won't be given a pass, okay? When I say that, an overnight pass. Now what? is going to happen, think about this for a minute, because I go on vacation as much as I can. My boss will tell you that. Um, it's one of the things I love doing. The latter part of my life, I'd like to spend more time with my family um, before my son leaves. But the, um, the benefit of this is that you can kind of track how many are going there. The thing you have to be careful of is that when I go on vacation and my wife's entire family joins us in some way, unfortunately, but when they do, they, they have to be given guest passes because they're coming to see us at the condo that we're at, okay? So there's a balance there as well between giving them a pass that is easily recognizable as somebody who's just visiting versus somebody who is a, a member guest. So three terms to remember that I'm trying to get my staff to really get into. One is a member, that's all of y'all, okay? And by the way, that's also the resort. That's also the partners, okay? And anyone that you invite is a member guest. The other group that we're dealing with is visitors, okay? When we're dealing with visitors, they traditionally start out as people we don't know. There's no destination. You haven't called them in the past. The resort hasn't called them in the past. And here they are saying, I'm going to the Ryder Cup bar. Okay, you know where it is. I can't ask that question. <laughs> but <clears throat> nonetheless, because uh, I'll be seen as rude, but nonetheless, um, you know, they'll, they'll come there often and, and they don't even sometimes know where, what the name of the thing they're going to, okay? And we have to ask them more questions. Well, what we're doing, and the board, again, authorized this, is we hired two more staff members to be able to put four people in our commercial pass office and change the commercial pass office to a pass office. So hopefully, if everything goes the way that it's intended to go in June, the pass office will open up and it will be open from 7 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night, Monday through Saturday. That's the goal. Okay? Mm -hmm. Here? Here. Here. Same place. Right over here. So, two different offices now. Okay? Um, and what will happen is anybody who comes in here that's commercial, everything will stay the same. Okay? Initially, everything will stay the same. When they come in here and they're a visitor, as I've defined, then they're being sent over here. Okay? And they have to get the license. Vehicle registration, insurance, destination. And all that's going to be put in the system. Remember now, the system will say, you have a guest. Okay? Initially, we're going to issue them the pass. If they're going to the Ryder Cup bar, they're going to go to the gate. They're going to show their pass. Ryder Cup bar will know they've come through the gate. And then if they want to use the option, when they get there, they can hit. And the system will know they actually went to their destination. <coughs> That's kind of where we're, where so we're who is hitting that? Is it the guest or is it then somebody who's running the Ryder Cup bar? 
it would be somebody that's an employee of the resort or the partners or, or wherever that. <coughs> um, and, and you can actually do that in Europe yourself as well. And when they drive through the gate with that pass, their license tag. Yes, they got their license plate will be, and that's the other thing that we're trying to, I'm trying to figure out the proper distance because what I'm trying to do is get a double check here. So today somebody comes over, particularly commercial contractors, and they'll come in now and they know they gotta get their license, their vehicle registration, their insurance, and we'll give them a pass. And then we will find them over at the general store giving that pass to their employees, okay? And when we find that, we stop it, we take the pass, we go, shh, you're done for that. Um, what the license plate reader is going to be able to do is tell us that that license plate is not in our system. So if they come there and they try to get through the gate with this pass, and they're using something that's other than what was put in the system, the system's gonna say, they're not in there. And then we'll know to stop them, take their pass, review it, and determine whether or not maybe the license plate reader, maybe the license plate is muddy, maybe there's something obstructing it, maybe the reader, they're not 100%, it's about probably 97% now, okay? But when you look at it, it's usually 100%. It's whether or not the computer can pick out all the numbers. Okay? They also make a little thing when I'm pushing a little bit, maybe it's going to stop it from happening. But, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in any event, there's going to be cross checks that are going to be going on. The best thing about all of this is that the, the, the Jimmy and the board has, has passed also us changing from barcodes and changing to RFID readers. Okay? So the money for the budget, budgeted money for the leaders themselves is already in this year's budget. To try to have funded all of the new barcodes, not barcodes, but stickers that were going to be needed, it's going to be thousands and thousands. A hundred thousand, a hundred thousand dollars basically. Um, so trying to fund that while we're funding a new system, while we're funding um, ALPRs, while we're funding everything else that Keegan needs to do, drainage and everything else that just wasn't going to work. So we funded the, the actual devices to be installed at the fourth quarter of this year, okay? And then the stickers to be able to be purchased in the first quarter of next year. So we'll start phasing away from, if all things go budgetarily like they should, and money's collected like it should, and revenue goes, and there's no real challenges, then we should be moving away from barcodes and to RFID stickers beginning next year. Yes? So I think all of this is really excellent and, and wonderful development. It, are there going to be clear signs that say all visitors must turn right before the gate and then must turn left onto into here? That is a fantastic question. Um, and it's actually one of the challenges that I'm actually working on now. Is I'm now with the real estate office, and one of the challenges they have is that when we turn people around right now, um, they will go to the real estate office and um, they're going to the pass office. Yeah. Um, so they're getting very frustrated with that, obviously. And so we become more detailed and say, at the stop sign, make a left. And they go down until you see this sign. And some of them still, they, they, I think they're waiting. And maybe, maybe a sign at the pass office. Well, and, and the sign is here to get in here is bad. And it it is is every, every time I, I watch, I sit and watch all the traffic on Beach Walker. <laughs> drive, go past the that's where the kitchen window is. And, you know, they're always like, you know, all the stuff that's going down. And particularly remarkable now that um, Beach Walker County Park has not opened mm -hmm. that much traffic. There still is going down there and around the back. It's not all going up to right. So, um, it would be good to improve the signage here. And it um, doesn't have to be the fancy sign, it just has to be something so people actually know they have to turn left, left into the pass office. Well, and you know that those are controlled by the ARB, so they do have to be fancy signs. Well, we're paying, um, we're paying at least one ARB salary, I heard, at least 70%. <laughs> I, I think there are different types of signs. Yes. I, I think that there's some permanent signage upgrades, but I also think in the early stages there's some temporary signage when people are adapting to I, I would, change. I would love it. And then the other thing is, there's gotten to be an incredible, I don't know what the plan is for how to deal with the increasing um, bad behavior that's going on in the gate in terms of people sitting in the left lane and then they all of a sudden beyond the stop sign cut into the right lane and 
they're sophisticated to generate all kinds of rear end accidents. So I talked to Shannon about this already and Jenny, and, and I've also gotten with Ed, who is our representative in the ARB, and I've asked for a meeting with them, uh, and just from the administrative part, just to have a conversation of opportunities for enhancements. Some of those are the signage you just mentioned. Some of them are the temporary signage that Jenny mentioned. Some of them are how do we deal with not only the ones that are coming in the inbound and suddenly changing lanes and almost causing an accident, but how do we deal with the outbound? <laughs> Right. Now, temporarily what I've done, again, is I've shared that information with the Sheriff's Office, shared the complaints with the Sheriff's Office, and they have been writing tickets there. Um, and, and I expect they'll be writing a lot more. Now, what they tell me, regrettably, is it is generally property owners. Um, and, uh, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but in any event, all that is being looked at is my point, but it's stuff that has to be worked through, through the process but we're already beginning that because we realize the same thing. Tell me, as part of that, as a follow-up to Marilyn's question about the regular fence, I know in the past, if people have gone in and said, you know, they'd like to go and, you know, just drive around the island and see what's available, they've been able to get passes from the partners. They just give it to them. Has that been cut down on, or if not, will this alleviate that issue. So the partners being owners as well have the ability to put in their own passes just like we do. However, what they have done is recognizing that some of their staff were being a little bit more free with those they should is they've reduced their list of people who are authorized to do that. Um, and that has become more under control. We don't have people generally just coming in just to cruise around without an intent to either buy or do something else that the partners have on the island. Uh, I've seen very little of that. When I first got here, I saw a lot of it. I heard a lot of people just driving around. But with some of the changes that we made in the contacts and just the changes in behavior, um, I think that we've pretty much gotten good control of that. One of, one of the great things that has happened as Tony has gone and presented um, all of these forthcoming changes to uh, real estate, resort, et cetera, is <laughs> Their employees have had some um, aha moments where they have said, wait a minute, you mean I'm going to be attached to that pass? I'm going to be <laughs> responsible for issuing it? And um, Tony said, that's right. You're absolutely right. It is your guest. You are responsible for them. Hey, John, I don't know why you have anything other than zero tolerance for that. I mean, it's the challenge if you have a property. If you tell me somebody's coming to your property, I have no right to question that. Um, and you would be probably very angry with me if I did. No, but attaching my name to that pass. Oh, that is zero trouble. That's going to happen. Not an option. Yeah, Whether you're a partner or anybody else. Not right. right. <clears throat> the, the current system wouldn't allow me to do that. Okay. Yeah, the okay. new system will allow me to absolutely do 100% attach yeah. it to somebody. The new pass is that around this new system, like. You know, obviously my regular car has a barcode, but if I come in and I have a rental car and I get a pass from the gate, will the new passes have like a QR code so you know who I am, or is it still gonna, because I guess, personally, it bothers me that my name and my address are printed on that, because let's say, sure, I can take it out of the window, but I go to the grocery store and it's in my window, right. and it's got my full name, or I go downtown and it's got my full name and address on it. For a safety concern, that sort of bothers me. So will the new ones just have a QR code where you guys can scan it if you need to, or? No, we still are going to have. Or a pass, like our. Or a pass a number? A pass number, yeah, something so it's not like. The, the challenge is. Unused car. If we're weird. going to have our people out there on patrol actually determining if people are where they belong, then we have to have a way to know where they are supposed to be. Um, the only way that we can do that officially is I can't have them run around with scanners. They can't, but they can't have them on their phone. But um, well, you know, you start to create a much more challenging system. It's something that we can entertain going forward. But, but there's a different something. way to not to, to link us to it, but not I'll, I'll, have our name, like maybe okay, have our address, but not have our name and address. You know, we might be able to get the system implemented, but that's a very good point. Maybe I can do something for the property owners. It changes. Right. I mean, maybe happens. like that. If it's your, your property so, owner, so it's not. Yeah. Right. But, you know, hmm. I personally find it very useful because we live near the beach, very walking distance to the beach, and so all kinds of vehicles are parked and start my driveway and are in the thing. And so I can walk over to the car that's 
that shouldn't be there. And I can look in and I can see exactly where that vehicle is supposed to be. And so when I call security, I get them out there sooner and say, you know. This well, they can still have a number, though, or something. You can, you, know, you, can, you can put it in your, in your we, we have a disability sticker for my husband which, that I will use when my husband is in the car, which is what it's supposed to be done with. And I just take it, it goes into the into the glove compartment. Right. Well, there's got to be a different way so, to do it. So we can have a number attached up. to it, and you can still write down the number. What this number brings up is a really interesting That's dynamic up. of uh, two sides of a right. point here. So but the number would still be attached this, to the name. And more than name. willing to take a look at it and yeah. see if there's a way to accomplish both goals. Let me get the system implemented. Let us get it rolled out. It's just out. something to think about as they're building right. the system. Thank you for that. And the other thing is on that whole rider cup thing, which yes, it's a known fact, but it was also blasted on next door by Seabrook class a couple of weeks ago too, as they were discussing their security concerns and questions and comparing it to things that we do over here. And they were like, oh, well, you just say you're going to the right. And I was like, the, the NDL, do we need to, website a couple right, of but do we need to like yeah. throw it out there? Tony, could you please clarify, um, it, so if you have a gate that's been issued by the resort, Kika, a property owner, you can go right through the gate. Anybody who doesn't, who wants to come on the island for any reason, is going to have to come to pass office. What are you going to do to accommodate all these cars? All these turnarounds? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, when, I mean, I think it's a great idea. Don't right. get me wrong. But how do we accommodate that? Because there are folks who right. are going through the gate right now. Well, today what happens is they come up to the gate and they hold the gate up. They go on over the line pass, you know. Um, oh, no, no. I got that. But um, so what that, happens here when we can't park for a meeting sometimes? So, so last year, I mean, let's just use real numbers because um, I think that's that's helpful. Um, last year, 50,000 <laughs> 50, people out of 2 million came to the gate with no pass. So they were all coming um, through the parking lot? Well, I don't think so. I, I, I think a large number of those really were going to the resort. Tea times, restaurants, whatever. And when Tony talks about Roger and his team working very closely with us, the key thing for them is to make sure they have a system implemented so that when we go live with this, there's a way to deal with that. So, so those people know that if they really are going to the Ryder, we don't want to stop anyone that really is coming to the Ryder Cup bar. They have a number or whatever they do to call, that pass gets entered in, they never come here. So, Maybe it's 25,000 a year, 30,000 a year. When you break that down, right. now we're hourly number, it's, yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be more people here, but. Um, so if, we'll I, if I could really quickly, and then I'll take up more questions, um, to elaborate a little bit on, on the deal with the resort. So the resort, the reason we're not live now is the resort needed more time to develop the back end of their system so that they could actually um, have a number that would be on a flyer that we can hand out that they could call and instead of making reservations because they don't take reservations they will take the information of the individual and issue them a pass so instead of giving them a pass or a reservation they'll give them a pass to get to their facility so they'll be managing a lot of those and that's why we waited so i would say a good number of them like jimmy just said is, is going to be handled already by the resort and what we're going to do as soon as they get done making it up is we're going to have them in our offices and at the gate so that when people come here today and as soon as they give them to us and say they're going to the resort and we do what we do today we'll explain to them the process is changing and in the future <coughs> what the resort wants you to do okay now we're not handing that out to everyone only those people who come up and say they're visiting the resort now does that mean that somebody can say okay aha i'm just going to call the resort and the resort's going to issue me a pass and then the resort is going to be accountable for the fact that I'm just going to the beach. Yes, it can happen. But if we put the other things into place where they acknowledge that somebody's there okay, <coughs> or not there, and then we see the violators, so to speak, then what we do is we go after the individuals who are constantly doing that. And the people who came here after the straw market got torn down, because this is when I got the sudden epiphany that is, we do have a problem. Mm -hmm. They tore down the straw market. People were coming here and getting mad at staff with me standing there 
and saying, now what do I do? I've been going to the beach for 20 years like this. Wow. <laughs> so I shared that with Roger, and Roger was like, that was empirical for him that he realized, okay, it did happen. Okay, so we're changing all of that. The other thing, really quickly, with the RFIDs, today, our codes are on your cars. When we get to next year, employees are going to have the RFIDs, and contractors who buy annual passes are going to have the RFIDs. Now, why is that important? Well, we can track them coming and going, okay? And we can also, most importantly, we recently had a contractor that was told he couldn't come on the island. He kept coming on the island because he had the stickers because they just were regular stickers and they were all white trucks. And how do you stop that? Well, in the future, we'll be able to turn off their code. And probably the most important one is that think about how hard it is to fire someone and then have your HR person go out and start to go inside their car to view their employee decal when they're mad about being fired. In the future, all we can do is turn their code off. Okay. Yes, sir. People coming in without passes, probably 50 or 60 percent of the time I come through the gate now, there's four or five concrete trucks, dump trucks, pop the way inside. Right. They're not going to be able to do a U-turn to come over here. They're not going to be expected to come here. All right, but what if, I mean, why are they stopping now? If, if they're stopping now, that means they don't have a pass, they don't have anything on their truck. And I mean, some of these concrete trucks are companies that are here all the time. Is it because that individual truck doesn't have a pass? It's normally because the company hasn't purchased the passes and they haven't purchased, they, they, they have the opportunity to purchase them annually, they have the opportunity to call ahead of time, they have the opportunity to have the member pay for the pass. The ones that don't do any of that are the ones that pull over. Um, now, to enhance safety, and one of the things that we did get approved that's being worked on this year is, is a, an additional um, area for them to park that's actually going to be marked. Um, so they can actually park, and I believe that's going to be on the left-hand side as you're coming in. Because right? yeah, I've never in a situation, uh, fortunately, at this home, but some people deliver stuff that don't have a pass. It's 25 hours. The truck drivers don't have it. Right. So twice I was on the phone call, you got to let them in, okay? Is there a way that the property owners can, quote, register their address so if somebody shows up, a delivery truck shows up, that they can automatically charge us so that they can get through rather than turning it around and coming back a week later? It's, sometimes you're just not here. Right. So we're trying to actually have them build into the system where the property owner can actually accept the delivery and pay it, and pay it, on, pay it there online, accept the payment online. Um, so in other words, you're agreeing to pay it. Right. Um, we're, we're, we're working on that, is my point. Um, realizing that there's a lot of things that, that can be more expeditious for y'all. Um, but then again, there's an accounting issue on the back end of that. Because we will have some owners that will come into us and they will undoubtedly say, I did not agree to have those three deliveries. Um, so we just have to figure out how to manage that best. But it's possible. It's, but some of these big construction trucks, they pull up to the gate, let's say it's 50 tons of structural steel. You know what's going to the resort. If they don't have a pass, just let them through and send a resort bill. The resort won't accept that bill at this point, uh, but what I have done is talk to Roger about opening up an open account again and seeing if it's possible to make it work to where we'll give them an accounting and all the information. Because now we're capturing the license plates, we're capturing, you know, so we're getting a lot more information and they're amenable to that. So there's a good possibility that's going to happen. And, and one other thing relative to the, uh, the rental, probably shouldn't have done this. Before I moved here, I always kept my barcode in luggage, and I would just tape it on the car. Mm -hmm. So would people who are part-time have the ability to get a correct code or whatever it is, that literally would identify itself as a rental car of a property owner so that they can get in all the time, don't have to worry about it? Because I agree, putting the passes in the front mm -hmm. uh, paying. If, if we could get together and talk through that a little bit after, um, even at a, at a later date, that would be great because I want to understand exactly where you're headed with that. There is a possibility of always having, um, you know, ones that are hanging. Um, there's all kinds of different RFID uh, devices that are out there. Um, so let's talk through that and see if there's an opportunity there. Just to put it on the, the radar, not something that you can implement right away, but 
just from a traffic pattern standpoint, um, when the guests are coming in on the left hand side and the residents are coming in on the right hand side from the main gate, it seems to me that about 75 to 90 percent of people come in on the left hand side immediately turn right on Kiwa Beach Drive. We're all, whereas all the residents come in on the right hand side and mean bear left um, <coughs> at that Kiwa Beach Drive yes. intersection. Which I think the, the intersection yes. needs to be improved anyway for the increased traffic that's going to happen when the resort opens the hotel and the uh, access to timbers goes through there and the bill of check in and all. But right at the gate, there's an automatic cross that happens, which, if, which could be fixed if you, if you thought about the uh, reversing and having the residents come in on the, on the left and, and the bottles on the right. We thought about that. The only challenge to that mm -hmm. is that the main gate is set up with everything that is needed to check everything that has to happen for a visitor, and not inside that little kiosk. Yeah, I, I understand. So but that's right. that's this is a long term. Right. It's it's not, um, um, you know, when when the um, <coughs> resort came to us um, a couple of years ago with their sort of grand West Beach redevelopment plan and um, needed our cooperation to make changes to that intersection where the roundabout <coughs> is and, and whatnot. They presented us with a traffic study that they had done, or their engineering firm had done. And, I mean, we had no reason to question their firm, but I mean, there are a lot of assumptions built mm -hmm. into traffic studies. And so um, what we did is we, had our own, we hired our own firm, not to do another traffic study, but just to analyze the reasonableness of the assumptions and the conclusions that they made. And they came back and, and essentially what they said was, we think that the, the volumes on Kiowa Beach Drive and at the new roundabout and all of that, we think it all works. When it opens, where we would be watching is the intersection of the park. We're not recommending a change right now, but we would be looking at the intersection of Kiowa yeah, Beach Drive and Parkway <laughs> and um, doing some analysis on whether or not there needs to be a turn lane or, or what have you. But um, so I, I think it is a long, longer term. Yeah, I, I just like it to be on the radar because there, there are a lot of people that come out of Kiowa Beach Drive and wait 10 minutes to, to, to make a left hand mm -hmm. turn to, just to leave the island. And it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes to see at least. Yeah. And if I could, and we'll, can I just hold those for one second? There's one more product that I wanted to talk to you all about. Because remember, I told you that I'm kind of, how do you build all these things together into one system? So uh, I have someone that I know from my previous employment that actually uh, sells software to, used to work for IBM, and they sell software to the Department of Homeland Security's Emergency Management Division, to the Secret Service, to the FBI, well, a lot of other agencies in, around the world. Um, and it's a company called Priority 5. You can actually look it up on the internet, Priority 5. And what that company does is called a situational analysis tool. Um, and everything that we have that has any kind of a device that hits the internet, that has an IP address, that has some kind of an AIP, any of that kind of stuff can all be pulled into this device so that when we're looking at it, we will basically have a dashboard. And on that dashboard, it can tell us if our gates are functioning properly. They can give us numbers of visitors. It can tell us, uh, show us the cameras. If we have an incident that happens, we're trying to link it to the county system so that it will immediately pull up the cameras in the area of the incident if we have cameras. Um, we're, we're putting motion sensors on the cameras that are at the pools. Why? So that when they close, Instead of us having to watch the cameras all night, if motion happens at the pool, the cameras will come up, alert the security officers that there's motions at the pool. 
um, so that we can then respond to that. Um, money was put in this year's budget, and I'm trying to find a site to put a camera. Those of y'all who don't know, there's a camera currently at 17 and Main, at, right there at the seafood restaurant, Gilligan's, that lets us see if traffic's moving, oh, which become important to us. But now the money was put aside to try to put one over there on the James John Island connector. So that y'all can see as residents anytime you want, is traffic flowing that direction? Um, so you can get that kind of an answer. Um, so this device <laughs> is guessing that it's not. <laughs> this, this application is actually can do a whole right, lot more often than not the same as I think it's really important that you're looking at this again because before the second lane was added to the main gate, the request was made along the lines of what Scott's talking about yeah. be exactly because of what it was and Buddy in his infinite wisdom chose to ignore all the concerns and just go ahead and do what he was doing and there is, now there is no land you know to, to, to do that originally which obviously complicates things but it's not a static situation, so it really is good to be constantly looking at it to see what can be done differently, what can be done to improve things. And when we buy that by the way, we have one gate, and you have a lane that went this way, and a lane that went this way, and you just split them on each side. Um, that's what I've seen in some other resorts. When we finish with all the security questions, I have one other one for you. Okay. Yeah. I'll go back to the traffic thing. There's like two crossovers. There's the residents who know the crossover yet and will not come in right away. And then there's the other group that doesn't know it. And it, the lines are, the arrows are painted wrong because it says straight line, straight line. And then right at the intersection, it finally tells you it's a right turn lane only. And so then that's why that intersection is so bad because it can't, this line, you can't assume anybody's going to be turning right there because there's a lot of people that all of a sudden do it that way. That information was actually turned over to Will Cotter who is our MRR &R director, because uh -huh. that's his area uh, of responsibility to take a look at that. I know that him and Shannon and Jimmy have been working closely mm -hmm. on a lot of intersections, but that's been a big one. Yeah, because going out is very clearly marked that it's, it, the left lane is, you know, going, there's a sign that says it's gonna be a turn lane, right. there's painted arrows that says it's gonna be a turn lane. Mm -hmm. And so why it's different going in. And yet people still go straight. Right. I know. <laughs> One of the things that's been popping up on Ikea recently, and it's it's frustrating. Later in the day, trying to get off the aisle, it's backed up 20 or 30 cars. And I think it, it's only for an hour or two. I think if you can get a security person up there direct the traffic, just to let the people fly for the stop sign. Because oh, people are stopping at the stop sign, and they're waiting, and, and it's not that many people pulling out, but uh, it, it's just... I, I mean, I was there one day, it was, it was five minutes before, from where I stopped first before I got through the gate. And it, it's just that they can just speed that up. It, it doesn't happen for a long period of time. Get somebody up there. Well, I think the left hand turn at that time. And, and, yeah, the, the other thing truck. is, the other thing to prevent that when it's that busy and some people get frustrated, they go on the left hand turn. Yeah, I've seen that. You, there's something you can put up there. They temporarily just put a cone up there so they have to turn right because. A guy cut me off the other day, somebody cut me off, the guy was in a Porsche and trying to catch him. And uh, he just came flying down the left lane, didn't even stop at the stop sign. It and it was a, it was a, it was a resident at the time I got. So one of the challenges there is called jurisdiction. Um, that's actually in the county. It's not to this property. Um, we do have the ability in emergency situations um, I have permission from SLED, which is where I have to get it if I'm going to do anything outside of my jurisdiction, to be able to manage that in emergencies. But on day to day, they haven't given us permission to be able to be out there. So normally, we'd be able to probably do that, there wouldn't be any issues. My only concern would be is if we cause an accident, okay, <coughs> then we would come to the question of what was our jurisdiction when somebody decided to get a lawyer and sue us. What was our jurisdiction to manage that at that particular intersection? But let me take a look at that, take a look at it again with the town, and then maybe we submit something to SLED and see if they'll give us some general jurisdiction. I saw that three or four emails last night. Um, this morning. Um, 
And I, you know, I was just thinking about the statistics of construction activity alone right there. 104 new homes under construction right now. Um, you know, you assume three or four cars per construction site, at least, that's probably low. Um, then you have the Cougar Point Clubhouse, that's probably 25 or 30. The conference center, at least that many. The sanctuary chapel, and, um, and uh, yeah, and, and they were basically all leaving at the same time. And, um, Can I ask a longer term question? If you fast forward 10 years, when we're not building, the resort's not building a big new conference center, and many more homes are actually built, and there's you know, presumably less construction, do you expect to have more traffic or less traffic than what you have today? Just Yes, yeah, so some of these are short-term problems, and some of them may be longer-term problems to solve for. I'm just trying to get a sense of where the well, are just different. And don't forget, just to add to your question, while there may be fewer instances going forward of new construction, you're going to have more and more teardowns. Yeah, 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 so it, it, it is the same <laughs> as a new construction, but it's not all new construction. So. I'm talking about the number volume, so I, you threw out a two million number. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but is that going to be three million, or is it going to be a million, or just a long term? What, what do we think the trends? Are? So, so a minute ago, I said assume three or four cars per construction site. I mean, I just made that up. I said it's prob that's probably a low number. Um, it's been a long time, but when um, I was in a similar position uh, out at Daniel Island, the community was still sort of in the middle of its growth pattern. And we got a lot of, a lot of concerns about traffic and there was so much construction activity. And we actually did ask a firm to look at, you know, what, what how does it, how does it level off after the intense construction activity uh, is done? Uh, and their conclusion, and again, this is old data from another community, but their conclusion was is that you should expect uh, things to settle down a good bit when the, because of the very reason, you know, a new home has, and they, they put a number on it, the average number of car trips per day for a new home under construction. Yes, we will have renovation, but it's typically not five cars there. Um, so, I, you know, I don't have a, a great answer, but I think um, as construction winds down, the, the traffic pattern should should be a little more comfortable. Um, and, and, and you also disperse the cars at different times throughout the day when it's traditional residential traffic versus construction traffic. It's really heavy in early in the morning and really heavy in the afternoon. Uh, whereas residents come and go. I guess the dilemma is, are you, are you given the fact that you've got scarce resources, <laughs> you've got immediate short-term problems, but you also have longer-term bill, you know, and getting that balance right uh, is, I think, uh, something for you guys to, to work through. Well, the challenge, I mean, the, the, I mean, any security operation has challenges, but when, <laughs> When you, you're trying to have a gate that provides access control, um, but you also have a public resort, and it's really the only option, it's the only way to get on. I mean, there, there are a lot of, and you're trying to provide customer service. I mean, these, I, I like to think that for you all, for our residents, that the people working at the gate are greeters, not guards. <laughs> You know, we don't, Tony said, we told him don't turn it into Fort Knox. I mean, we, we want you to be able to get through efficiently, um, and we want there to be a friendly smile, um, and we want you to feel like welcome home every time you get there. But there's so many competing interests going on there at the gate that it, it is a challenge. Yeah, I would argue it's a good challenge to have. It's better, better to have one access point and solve those problems than have 10 access points. That just creates even, even more headaches. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Will the new security system help 
with uh, once people sell their home. <laughs> now I know several people whose taxes are still active. Right. They can move to Seabrook or somewhere else. And they can still get on key of what they don't need in their gas. Well, that is there also something? The RFI usually turn off. What? The RFI sticker no. Then why off. isn't it now? The barcodes should be removed. The barcodes are being turned off. Yeah, the barcodes should be being turned off already as well. Uh, the only challenge I can see is that they somehow have gotten the uh, partner's VIP sticker because those are good for two years. So I can see that being a challenge, but um, the property owner's barcodes are turned off. And that was actually one of the things that got me thinking about contractors and employees. Is they get a sticker that even if they're fired, it's good for the year unless I know who they are. I mean, a lot of them on the island. But if you as a property owner, you sell your house and turn it off like that. Um, well, we're going to be doing that with them now. So, you know, we've had a lot of um, members come forward and talk about the same vessel parking lot. Yes. And um, I, I told somebody that if you come in here today that I would ask that question and see if you have any answers to that. Well, uh, I'm sorry, what's the next question? So, um, there's feeling that people come and park there to go to the beach yes. when they're not um, mm -hmm. members and that it sometimes creates problems. And so, like, there were suggestions of putting a gate on there and all kinds of things. And I didn't know what to put that. We actually have budgeted money um, to have a gate design done um, to see if it's even a possibility if we have the roundabout. And I think that a lot of the discussions going on is the whole roundabout might have to be redesigned. Um, and Will Connor Engineering is working on that now. So that's one possibility. The other possibility that you know Jim and I have been talking about in Shannon is um, you know, now that we'll be collecting license plates and things like that. I mean, once I get to a point where um, you know, I've, I've got a license plate reader in a car, and they're driving through and identifying people as not members. It's very easy for us to pick them up. So then comes the question, even today, I can go there and see they got a visitor's pass that don't belong there, but I got to get out. Right. But it would be more efficient in the future. Then it comes the question, what do you do with the car? Okay. So do you hunt them down on the beach? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I think the answer that I'll probably will say is no, you don't go drag somebody from the beach. Um, do you tow their car? Do we want tow trucks, you know, coming in one from the sandcastle? And I saw that in the so the answer would probably be no. Um, do we boot it so all the cars have got a little fuel on? And they can't go anywhere until they call us and give us a nice hefty ride if you're using the parking lot as a beach. These are all things that are going on uh, in discussions. Which are um, headed forward. And we are looking at it. We're going to try to identify it. If we can gate it, then we don't need to do all those negative things. Charlie, in terms of the details of that, the resort and the partners have, which one has one shaped like a state and which one has a rectangular one? Shaped like a state? Yes, oh, one shaped like commercial. You're talking about commercial decals. Yeah, you're talking about commercial decals. It's shaped like it's shaped South like Carolina. Kind of like a shield almost. Yeah. 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 So that's a commercial decal. Right. Yes. Um, and then you have the employee decal that looks similar. Um, and then, but it used to be you could tell the difference between a vehicle that was owned by the resort or a vehicle that was owned by the partners. It was, I mean, they have a round sticker once for the partners. Oh, They've got that round green VIP sticker. Okay. okay. Um, with the traditional. <coughs> okay. Just going back to the being able to make a left hand turn on Kilo Beach Drive, which even without any, without the clubhouse being open, without the convention center being open, and without the bill of check in being open, it's becoming almost impossible to make a left hand turn out of there at virtually any time, unless it's like uh, one of the problems is that you have people that are going to be making a left hand turn. To Kilo Beach Drive from Governors, uh, from Kilo Island Park Parkway, they will block both lanes. Is there any way of, of or they'll go up three? They don't leave any room for anyone coming to the other way. Let the cattle pass? Well, is there any way of at least putting a sign up that says, do not pull into no. the intersect? Excuse me. We'll touch shit on the part Excuse me, I love it. Um, is there, is there uh, any way of 
Okay. Saying that they keep the only, the only one car at a time may be in the intersection. And, and one of the things I'm seeing is that it's resort folks that are also, and so I would think they might be responsive. Resort vehicles that are actually blocking and pulling in. So, and, and you know, it's only taking 10 minutes to get around the roundabout with all the construction and the people walking in there. And, and, and. Let me ask you, I'm going to do something that I hate doing, but I'm going to do it anyhow. I'm going to take a very unscientific poll. <laughs> um, if, if, um, if it costs $750,000 to build a roundabout at that intersection, worth it? Yes. 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 I have a question. Do you have a land for that? Probably, yes. Well, What's, what's interesting, Jimmy, just as an aside, because I've been spending time down there, um, golf course and stuff, that circle down there? So the new one. The new circle, of course, is significantly smaller than the one at Fresh Fields. And you can barely get from one, you know, entrance to an exit or whatever. People aren't, I mean, there's not time to put a turn signal on. You don't know whether people are in or off of it, so it's, you might think about that if we go that way. How yeah, could it be designed yeah. for, if for that? If you put one in, it ought to be big enough. So you yeah, know. or uh, well, yeah, it's it's more of the main road it should be big enough. To make, to make sure. But it's not actual You track. know, I mean, that number, I, I think it's probably it's a reasonable so guess. We, we did an estimate of probable costs on a roundabout after the VA a few years ago. It was about a million dollars. And the conclusion at the time of, of the board was, yeah, it'd be nice, but it just it didn't. With that amount of money, it didn't. You know. But I think the resort, I, I think KP should let really help to the city into that. They want a lot of the traffic folks from the resort to come in and do the traffic. I, I think we should get lots of people to contribute, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can. Um, you know, it, it would have it would definitely be voluntary. We can't does, the, does the resort see these issues as issues as well? Uh, if it starts to impact it, yes, they do. Because yeah. you can come back to the user experience that you want people to have. Sure. The, 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 the trick is to make all this stuff, whether it's a security issue or a traffic issue, go away from the standpoint of what the user sees and do it all in the back. Sure. That's what Roger and I talked about was <clears throat> when you come to that gate or you come to anything on the island, just like when I visit somewhere, if I'm there for the resort, I think the whole thing is the resort. Right. <clears throat> if I'm there to visit you as a property owner, I think that's a beautiful place you live and it's all about the exactly. homeowners. Okay. If I'm there for the partners, I think it's all about that. And so if you're a visitor, you're a prospective piece of the economic right. right. How many people have said, I visited here in the 1970s or 80s and I had to buy a house? Um, there, on, on Sunday, I was driving, and there, uh, there's a bike biker on the parkway. And so I pulled the, my window down, and I said, "Oh, there's a path." And he goes, oh, "I can ride here." And it was whatever. And then so then I was going on the But I thought I would stop at the gate and tell them. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, so a sheriff was in there in the gate, and I said, "Oh, there's a." There's a bike around, you know, and he goes, they can ride on the gate on the parkway. I'll fix that. The I sheriff said, said the, the sheriff. The sheriff. The sheriff. And, then, was, was, and then I said, well, then why why do we have signs all along there that say you can't? He goes, I don't know why you put the signs up there. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a great example of this sort of shared, these shared responsibilities because it's not against the law. Right. Uh-huh which is what the sheriff's deputy can enforce. It is against Kiko rules, well, which yeah. our patrol person, I, I would be very disappointed if it was our employee that said. Well, none of the employees, you know, question that sheriff. Sure. And I thought, I'm not questioning me either. I just left. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so they can't. They should not. Be like, are there signs that say yes? There's a there are signs. signs every intersection. And it's safer that way. Red, 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 red,
10th Street to Helen, they say you know, yeah. 20 miles an hour down. Right. I, I or sometimes they're rude. Yeah. Oh, they're very rude. Yeah. They're yes. very rude to watch that. Yeah. Yes. I had a guest who did it. That was the last time they were invited. <laughs> well, what, what's the gate's responsibility or your staff's responsibility in that case? Because they, 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 they fight or just ride right by the gate? Right. Well, if they're um, exiting the gate, it's kind of hard for us to chase them down. Okay. Okay. If they're coming onto the gate, then what staff's expected to do is to call the patrol officer. Uh -huh. Patrol officer come out and find the bike and tell them to get on the leisure trail. If they see them and can say something to them, then that may be the time you hear them yell, you know, you need to be on the leisure trail. Now they're trying to yell politely. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and, and, and what will normally happen is is they will ignore the gate because they know they already passed it and we have to send somebody out there and try to find them. And we do have people that stop and a lot of them are members and the members say I can ride where I want. And we tell them, I'm sorry, but you can't you need to go on the leisure trails. Mm -hmm. What's the responsibility of the bike rental companies to make sure people that are renting the bikes know the rules? Because they give them rules. They give them rules. Them rules. I've rented bikes here for 20 years before I moved down here full time. And not once was buried under the chain inside the basket. There might be some rules. They just drop them off. They're there when I get there. This right. I've never seen anything that, that okay. tells me. They're supposed to be delivering the rules. Um, How many years they're supposed to be communicating the rules and what rules are probably should be on their websites. Um, but if there's a specific company you've had challenges with, it's, it's just, you know, they're, they're colored bikes. It, it, it's, some people know the rules, some people don't. Some of the people that I've stopped and said, sir, you know, uh, I went to Ocean Coast Drive, a five year old girl in, in her in car, and I just said, sir, there's a bike back over there. He said, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they know. Okay. okay. But some of them, you know, Kill. Just uh, sometimes give me a nice oh, visual yeah. sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're not worried. Yes, I said, not me. <laughs> hey, we'll go ahead and talk to them again. Okay, to make sure they understand what the expectations. Uh, where's the first sign on um, when you come from Ocean Course Drive to um, Governors? I think that, that first sign is a long way down. Uh, I don't know. You mean the, the sign, the no. red sign? If you started at, at Ocean Park. The sign that says, don't ride your bike, essentially? Yeah, one, one of those, don't ride your bikes. I think the first one coming that way is a long way down the road, and all we have to do is put another sign in there. Because in Ocean Park, um, it's a great place to ride your cycle. I know, because yeah. I do it. Yeah. Um, and then coming out of Ocean Park, um, drive, um, you go over to the, the bike path. But there's no sign that tells you to do that. And so we'll take a look I'll be impressed if he actually knows where the first sign is, but I'm going to the Ocean Course later this it's morning. Actually, it's actually at 7 Ocean Course Boulevard. I'll lie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was about to dispute you because I, I know it's not there. He's like, that's where I live. Like, no, I, I don't know. You should be riding your bike right there because there are bike paths out there, so yeah. you shouldn't be on the road. But there's no, there's no regulation in your student. So, so I think there's a bike path. The regulation is you're supposed to use the bike path. Yeah. So we'll you're in violation of our regulations. Is that true? I know there are some uh, okay. problems in that's, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> there are probably some folks that want to talk about some other things other than, than safety and security. Um, but just, uh, just sort of a final note on the overall bike issue. Um, you know, I, I, I love to, um, the, my favorite phrase that I've heard in 14 some odd years in this interesting business that I find myself in is that the developer builds the dream and we manage the nightmare. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and uh, it, it's not, I mean, we, we're very fortunate that the developer has done a lot of great things here, and, and, and by and large, we have terrific infrastructure. Um, but decisions were made that the leisure trails here were not for the guys on, you know, with the spandex and the helmets and going a million miles an hour, and that the roads weren't really built for that either. I mean, it was for, <clears throat> it was for leisure bike riding. And, um, you know, when you look at what 
when you when you look at Kiowa today and compare it to you know well, what are some of the great amenities and top-notch communities around the country um, you know if, if you can point to a deficiency and I don't think there are that many here but if you can point to a deficiency is that our our bike trails have never really evolved with the time. I mean, it just the system has gotten bigger, right. but they're still relatively narrow, and there are probably some places where that is just gonna always be the case. But there are opportunities, I believe, and, and again, all these opportunities cost money, whether it's RFIDs or heating the pool or, um, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that you want, if it's on your list, I mean, they all cost money, but I think with the bike trails, there are plenty of places where they they could be uh, widened uh, to Expanded. accommodate. Expanded. Yeah, I mean they could accommodate um, a different type mm -hmm. uh, of bicyclist experience. <coughs> um, you know, I was thinking my, my daughter and I took a, a walk on the Cooper River Bridge this past weekend, and um, you know that that wonderful pedestrian lane. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's wide enough so that a section of it is just for bikes and a section of it is just for pedestrians. And, you know, it can accommodate leisure and people that are going real fast. And, and so we have some, some challenges with, with the system that we have, but I do think there are opportunities to improve. It'll never be perfect. Um, you know, the serious bike riders, have, some of them have given up on me, but they're still, um, always lobbying. You need to let us ride on the roads. You need to let us do it. And I said, I understand that there's some of you that, that know how to do it, and you are fast, and you, you, you're responsible, but the minute the tourists see you riding down the road, they assume it's okay for them. And then all of a sudden, you have the baby carriage behind the, <laughs> behind the earth cruiser. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's never going to be perfect. Um, and, and you're never going to fix it completely with signs or anything else, but I do think there are ways to potentially get better and, um, you know, and, 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 there, and then there are also some breaks in the system, too, where there, there's just no leisure trip. Sure. Well, and what well, compounds it is the fact that when the roads out here were originally put in, when the island was first developed, the roads were permitted to be narrower than the county standards because you could park on the rights of way. That ended semi unintentionally after Hugo, when there was so much debris on the rights of way. And then people started putting in irrigation systems. And, and so you can't park on the rights of way now. So you're starting out with a road that's narrower than it would have been virtually anywhere else in the county. And you have all the things that you just noticed, and everything gets magnified. Um, yeah, a lot of this, Jimmy, is just managing people's expectations because you can't design a community environment to a segment of one unless you've got a little bit of money, right. which, which we don't have. And I don't have any high speed bikers that are on the island uh, versus people who want a space to, you know, versus people who want to. You know, so you've got to design things for scale sure. because you live in a scale. And, and I think some of this is just managing people's expectations about what's realistic and what's not realistic. Good, good news. Thank you for the cutout that saying that social bikers don't have to get yeah, on the bike. Yeah, that was my And we're uh, working on bike parking area. Yes, that's yes. in design. I'm surprised you did it because it takes up a parking spot. But <laughs> good. Well, prior, so. prior to that cutout, each person coming from Eugenia, including myself, figured out a different way to get to the sandcastle. So your little bushes got. Yes. Did you want to open my bush? I yes. did. <laughs> 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 that yes. invitation, we're like little mice. We now know how to go. So we do thank you. But yeah. I'd like to bring up something if it's okay. It's sure. Not, it's not about security. No, no, but that's not about I'm glad to hear that because security costs a lot of money. And my request is a very humble one. First of all, it's a big thank you for the bookshelves. Um, both for fiction and non-fiction. Um, people are always there now. It's a real magnet. Folks are really using it. It's a really go-to place on, at the Sandcastle. Um, um, so Brad, thank you. And again, that indentation for the bike trail, which we bike, it, it's fewer cars at the Sandcastle. So and on the bookshelves, I just I want to brag on our, our 
I got to help the guys. They actually built them. I could yeah. not almost hug them. We, we, <laughs> we had a quote for just one of the bookshelves from um, Low Country Case in Millwork for almost $10,000. Um, well, I am thrilled to ask for the next request. Our guys, um, <laughs> our guys built those in house. Yeah, and they were they're excellent, and they're receiving the wall, and um, they're they're amazing. Here's my humble request. Um, we're talking about all the amenities on the island, and what I really thought the biggest amenity was was the beach. And now I realize after being there for some time, it's really the people. It really is the population of folks living here. In that regard, some of us are in these community organizations in which we try to get community together to make it a community and make people want to be here. And the one that I'm currently working with is Kira Women's Group. And prior to the update at the same castle, um, we could ask for a room in good faith for a future date, and we had to pay a cleanup fee. Today, since the sand castle has been revived, you know, modernized, and I know you're getting a lot of business because I see a lot of bookings, and I'm thrilled, but it seems like that money that you're making now for events, private, that, you know, weddings and so forth, could help us be able to get a room without being charged, for me, for a tiny little room to just get people together for like a game of bingo, just to get a game together for community spirit. I'm being told that $75 for one tiny little room, and if we get enough people, then we get, you know, we have to pay 115 and more, even more. So we only charge $15 for a yearly fee for this women's group. And I think if you start making it really difficult for those of us who volunteer, and there are many of us in the room who do this, where we really can't even sustain it. I mean, we're like teachers. We go out and buy our own decorations now. We're doing money. And Kay said, you decide. It's worth $75 a room. So, I'm only going to you, and maybe you can work it out. I mean, it's really a humble suggestion to say, for those of us working with volunteer groups, let it be a little more user-friendly, because that's where you meet people, that's where you start having a community, it's a healthy way to be out there. I mean, it's bingo. Um, so, I'm really sad that I'm expected to sign a contract today or tomorrow to say we'll pay $75, when really, I would like to argue that with this kind of money we're talking about, only for those small groups, there are very few who do a community gathering of all the people on the island, that you would rescind that fee to encourage community or, or spirit. Make it nominal. Yeah. Well, I even asked them, I said, you speak clean up for 25, what if I clean up? They, oh, they don't provide anymore, it's 75. So there is no distinction between set up, clean up, or, or <laughs> rental. It's all $75 for one third and fee go up. But is, it's really hard. And we recently had a pops dinner. We all paid forty five dollars a piece, so ninety a couple. Plus, we all made our own appetizers to make it affordable. And you know, you can go to the river course and join arts, etc. Anyone can join that. And for thirty five dollars, you can get a wine, the meal delivered to you. You don't stand in line. I mean, I just want us to be competitive at the same time. I want folks to come. I want us to get to know our neighbors. Sure. And it makes it really hard to me when already I'm $75 in the hole and I don't have anyone signed up to play. And we don't want to charge them to come play with me. So that's my proof. Okay. You are not okay. okay, stop talking. He's going to talk. And his grandfather, yes. his grandfather, what used to be the case. Um, I, is this an after hours event? Yes, it's an evening event. Yes. Or the cops in there is that it's after hours. <laughs> We don't ask for much. I mean, it's just once in a blue moon. I mean, we just think this is big enough. No one's really using it at that time. I mean, in the winter, I wouldn't think. I mean, it really would. And then for other people coming behind us to volunteer, it's hard to get folks if, you know, it's, it's always a financial strain. It, it is always a financial strain. <laughs> the Sandcastle um, loses. Do you know the number off the top of your head? No, no, they're not they're losing them. Mm -hmm. They're providing community. Community is a big deal, too. That's why I like it here. It's community. It's, it's not. So, so this. It's, it's all a matter of transfer pricing. Not just that. You can't cross subsidize everything. Yeah. Is that you know what? The key to community, the community, it's supposed to be a community center. Uh, that's, that was, that's the rationale.
lashed out for it, not to be a wedding place, Thank you. not to have the pool closed off, not, not to say no to regimes having their annual board meetings when they've had it for 45 years and now they're told go to, go to the resort, which is what we did, and spent money through the resort to have our regime meeting, but there is no one available to open up a completely empty, room, uh, empty building. Jimmy, are you aware that one year for the Cuba Women's Group, we actually met at SeaWorld? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 would, I would love to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to answer. So, um, if a community group meets during business hours, when we're already paying staff to be there, um, and no staff is being asked to stay over, or we're not having to bring someone in, uh, it continues to be very nominal, if any, charge. Maybe Unless it's a, a large luncheon or dinner or something. Yeah. It, if, if an event happens after hours, when we would otherwise be closed, and we have to pay an employee to be there, to open and close the building, if there's, if there's cleanup, whatever, um, then I believe, now there are two members of the board here, and five, but I, I believe it's reasonable to charge a very modest fee to provide that additional service. When the sandcastle, when the community voted to build the sandcastle, um, a part of that vote was that it would, its construction and its operation would be funded by an amenity assessment. And it's on your bill every year. I think it's about $250 or something like that this year. And um, we currently, and I, I, I could be off, but that amenity assessment today falls, I think, about a half a million dollars short of funding the operation of that facility. So the community, the overall community is already subsidizing um, a half a million dollars worth of annual expense at the Sandcastle every year. And there are a lot of people that are paying that subsidy that um, don't have access to the Sandcastle. The, the, the resort, they're, they're not allowed to use it, but they're paying that subsidy. Now people do choose, if people choose to be a, a renter owner, that's their choice, but they're not real happy about subsidizing a facility that they're guessing. So so it just it, it comes down to, to trying to trying to make it work, trying to make the numbers work. I I agree with the comment that it's a community facility and it's but, but it's very frustrating it's not working and we have to come up. We get penalized if more people are willing to come. Suggestion. Is it possible, and you may have looked at this and determined that it's not, but is it possible, especially on days when activities are scheduled after, after hours, would it be possible to have someone, to have, in essence, flex hours? So, you know, on a day when there's an event that's going to end at 8.30, have somebody work 12.30 to 8.30 or 12.30 to 9.30 so that that time would be covered without it falling into an overtime situation. I don't know whether it's possible, but if you have to look at it recently, it might be. Okay. But I thought Kathy said there were issues getting Space for bingo during the day. No, no, and this is this is an evening. Oh, evening. Okay, never mind. But never mind. But never mind. It's only we're going to set up at six thirty. It's over at nine. We're not talking about partying late at night. This is a very two hours or less. I, I understand that. And whether you're managing that through flex time or whatever, you're still paying someone to be there at a time where they otherwise but, wouldn't be. But the so so we approved us. We didn't have to do that. We only came in. So just to say this was brought up at the board. And, good. Um, good. And you know that I'm I know I'm really happy with what you've been saying. Um, and I think I, I would like our board.
board to look at this again. And, and I think there's a balance here between um, what was done in the past and what we need to do for the future. I, I do think that when I ran the numbers for COPS, and I think I shared them with the board, they more than doubled our cost, um, which means that you know, we can pass some of that along, but you can't pass all of that along and so that we can participate. The yeah. issue, I think, Jenny, here is, um, and I would say this at the board, and I have said this, we have to think about um, that is a community center. And when we um, hamper community groups from using it, either by scheduling or by cost, we limit the number of opportunities for community activities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd really like to think about how do we balance this? I, I hear what you're saying about staff. I, I think that's legit. Um, and I do know that they often flex their time because I've had that conversation with them about how are they able to cover that. <clears throat> we have a talk, for example, about did you have community volunteers that have some responsibility there? Um, you know, so there may be other ways to manage this that we haven't thought about, and I'd really like to do that. Thank you. Just think about it. Totally different to topic, but back to Tony. Oh, this falls awesome. under, this <laughs> falls under <laughs> your failure. And I have asked this question numerous times before. First of all, I've said it before, I love the New Benton Center. It's, the view is fabulous. Good job, though. You can tell I'm using it, right? <laughs> I, wish, I wish we could get MSNBC and not just Fox and CNN, but that's, that's a separate issue. But, when you use the equipment and you look out toward the pool, there is a hand-printed sign that says not, not, an, exit. not an exit. How are we not in violation of fire code by not having emergency exit signs? Because it tells you you can't use this door. What if there's an emergency? How are people in the same castle supposed to get out of there? And I don't understand why it's not a violation of fire code. It's a it's so it's it's a load count on that room and the, the door that you come in through per the standard is sufficient for the load <coughs> that the room can carry. That is that may be factual, but you know, sometimes just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. I just really believe it's important that people ought to be able to just if there's an emergency, get off the machine and go right out. Doesn't that door work? So but you told, I mean, but the sign says don't use it. But it's not just a fire that gets on board. You think people are going to use it? Yeah. 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 No yeah. sign. You okay. know, with all due respect, that sounds like when the when state castle was first built. When? We'll look at trying to put an emergency exit on. Thank you. Does that help? Right. Like well, size is not an exit. Well, that's not a door. It's not a door. <laughs> <laughs> when did There's a lot of things it's not. <laughs> You know, we want, we, obviously we wanted, when we were doing that renovation, and we wanted it to be beautiful, and you, you and, and there's this balance, between, well, I mean, you have to do what the code says. I mean, you don't have any choice there, so you have to do what the code says, but um, the, the giant exit signs that are glowing above the door. I mean, they're, they're not beautiful. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I, you can put signs everywhere and um, it gets ugly really quickly. With all due respect, Jamie, that sounds a little like Leonard's response when the sandcastle John was first being built. Right. And he said, if you need an emergency exit and you're on the second floor outside, jump. There are dudes below. I mean, I just, <laughs> It just doesn't, again, we keep saying Kiowa doesn't do just the bare minimum. Kiowa does what's most important. And I think safety trumps beauty. Sorry. I live with a former fire commissioner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other, any Kiowa? Question. Uh, just on the uh, sandcastle, is the, um, are those? Restroom and, and shower facilities and the outside stuff. Is that finally finished or is it still going on? It's operable. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of fire, that 
building had to have its own fire suppression system. Mm -hmm. And um, the some component to it when they did the test mm -hmm. um, failed and so it has been reordered. But that's the only thing that has stopped a certificate of occupancy. Um, sure. So if you want to go in there and use the restroom, it should work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not officially open for occupants. Correct. So you really shouldn't go in there. Should we have a I have a question on, on the relationship, I'm a little confused, on the relationship between our security people and the, and the sheriff's people and, and past the gate are private roads, right? Mm -hmm. There are roads, we maintain them. You're the first we, person that's ever been confused. <laughs> and, and, and it seemed reasonable to me that we, and the, the sheriff worked for us, we contract with them. We have oh, the town contracts with them. The town? Right. Okay. Whoever we're the town to. Um, it seems to me that we should instruct them to enforce our rules as well as whatever the statute They can't. They can't. They can't <laughs> they can't they can follow our instructions. They can't lawfully uh, enforce things that are not codified. Um, so the fact that they're not statutes, laws, ordinances, they can't enforce community association rules. What if the town passes in one of them? Then they go. Kind of like drones. Well, we're going to, you know, right now we, we prohibit drones. Okay, but that's a rule. The sheriff's office cannot come in and make an arrest. So what would happen is, is that you're flying your drone in violation. I come and say something to you, and you're not a property owner, you're a visitor today, okay? And I say something to you, and you refuse to bring it down, okay? Mm -hmm. If I call the sheriff's office and say, do something about the drone, he's going to tell me I can't. So what I'm going to do to get around that is I'm going to say, you now need to leave the island or you're trespassing. And then I'm going to tell the sheriff he's trespassing and he's going to arrest you. So you have to have an ordinance or something. If you're a property owner, though, you're not trespassing. So Tony, are you saying that if the town passes an ordinance, the sheriff's going to enforce it on the side? Correct. That's tough. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So we just um, passed, the board just passed the approved rules on that this past uh, September. Um, and so they're prohibited from not flying in the airspace because they're not allowed to regulate the airspace. But you're prohibited from any area that Kika is, is responsible for Kika rules from operating, landing, or taking off a drone. Um, unless you contacted uh, Jimmy, Shannon, and me, more often than not, they'll give it to me because they actually sent me to pilot school to get licensed to know what's required. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll make sure you have the proper license if it's needed, that you have the right insurance so that we know when you're flying and where you're flying, and then it can be authorized. Drone pilot school would help. <laughs> No, drone pilots. But it's actually a pilot's license that says remote pilot, believe it or not. Um, but it ended up making it where I was able to actually understand what's supposed to happen per the FAA. And the people that, that are in business to like take photography for real estate, most of them know what that is. I mean, they're familiar with that. If I tell them they need to have a part 107, they know that means they need to have their drone pilot's license. I didn't, I, personally, I didn't think this was a, a big deal. And um, my mom, after like 20 years of giving me sweaters that don't fit for Christmas, she gave me a drone. And um, I was operating it and trying to figure out how to make it work. And I just actually, I realized, God, I'm like right up in my neighbor's window. Um, and that's when it clicked for me that, wait, this, you know, free, you know, Rain to just fly drones anywhere can create some real privacy concerns. And the town is looking at an ordinance as well. Yeah. All right, well, um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I know that um, Tony is happy.
happy to answer any follow-up yeah. questions on any of the security. Be on the lookout. We'll start communicating hopefully pretty soon on that stuff.